welcome to Struggles of the Spirit. I'm your host, uh, Reverend Lee Udell, and we're glad to have you with us today. Uh, some of you tell me that you watch this show regularly, and it's even a priority item in your, in your weekly schedule, and that makes me very happy. But I wouldn't know it by your response <laughs> live on the telephone. So I invite you again to call me up and uh, here at the studio and to give me and my guest uh, your response to what we're saying. Uh, it, it enlivens us and uh, helps us to think of new angles and directions to, to move in. So please do that. Uh, Richard, you can see the phone number. It's up on the wall. Mm -hmm. Could you tell our, our, our viewers what the number is to call? Oh, put my specs on. It's, uh, it's a different number than what's in the phone book. Can't quite make it out. Ah. Sorry to say. Well, well there it is, 651 0589. Okay. 651 0589. Okay. That's uh, direct into this, uh, the control room here of the studio, so you, you don't get uh, publicity or commercial ads or anything else. You get, you, you get Bill, who uh, manages the technical aspects of the show. So, uh, and Bill will uh, connect you with, with us, so we'll hear via a loudspeaker and a microphone uh, what you're saying, and then we'll respond directly to you via our microphones. Now, we're much more advanced than commercial television, because with commercial television, you can't do that. You can't uh, tell this great star of stage and screen what you think of his program. <laughs> you just have to listen. <laughs> you have no, no say, unless you want to write a letter and hope that somebody will give it to him. But it might be thrown out. You, there's no way to know, whereas here, you hear your, your message being given directly in your own voice to uh, our guest, uh, to Richard Doze, uh, Dr. Richard Doze, or to me, Lee Udell, uh, and then you hear our response. So please give us a call. Uh, we delighted to have you with us. Now, if you're watching the show and we're not sitting here live, and it's, uh, it's a tape, because we do replay it. Uh, we cannot talk with you, but if you give us via email your thoughts and your ideas, then we'll respond via our own email. The email address uh, for us is on your TV screen. Uh, I think it's at the bottom of the screen what, what the address is. So uh, please, please uh, write us your email message if you are not live w watching us here. We look forward to uh, receiving your message. And we'll get back to you. But some people uh, think we're on sitting here all the time waiting for their call, and they're disappointed when we, they discover on a Saturday we're, we're not really here physically. Mm. Our program is here, but we aren't. So that's how you communicate with us. So uh, thank you for connecting with us this morning. So our, our guest here is Richard Doze, Dr. Richard Doze. He's a clinical psychologist. He's been on the program before. He's also a practicing a Buddhist at, at the Shimbala Center on King Street here in Burlington. And he has a lot of experience in the world of mental health as, as well, and the medical school. He's been a professor there. So he's been around, and he has a lot to say. And we're going to talk today about re retreats. Uh, a retreat isn't, doesn't mean that you're running away from the enemy. <laughs> it's, in, our, in our usage of the word, it, it means that we're, we're trying to stop our present feverish pace and to look at our inner self and uh, where we want to go and what we want to do with our lives. And, uh, and there are different ways you can go about arranging for that to happen. And so both as a, as a Buddhist, uh, Richard is a practicing Buddhist, 
uh, and, and I can talk about the, the Christian perspective. But we, we recognize that retreats are necessary to regain perspective. So why don't I stop talking and let you, you begin talking about your part of this. All righty. Richard. Very good. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be back on your program, Lee. Thank you. I haven't seen you in a while, so this is a, a nice reconnection for me. And uh, I guess you could say that retreat, you could look at retreat as a way of reconnecting with yourself and in a fashion, as Lee was suggesting, uh, where you are become more free from the encumbrances of everyday life. You have a situation that is set up for you to have minimal responsibilities for attending to details. You're in a, hopefully, a, a setting that is uh, quiet and uh, free from interruptions to provide you with a context where you can begin to let your, your mind settle and as Lee was suggesting to, uh, I think the word that I would use would be to, to come to terms with your life, to actually experience your life directly in the raw, if you will, in its rawness from moment to moment. Uh, the, the, the sense of retreat has multiple connotations. Uh, Lee was suggesting that it doesn't mean a, an escape or a withdrawal or uh, an attempt to get away from an enemy, but it could have that connotation. It could. It could. And spiritually, it could mean that, too. Spiritually, it could. Uh, to get away from? From Satan. Ah, from, from demonic forces. Yeah. yeah, or things that are distracting you and keeping you from doing what you really want to do. Mm -hmm. in, in that sense, uh, the connotation of retreat might, might begin to have a flavor of asylum or sanctuary. I like that term, it's, uh, sanctuary. Uh -huh. So sanctuary uh, would have the, the connotation of protection uh, as well as sacred space. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that quality of uh, being protected from challenges that uh, you ordinarily might not be able to, to uh, withstand and it's in the sense of um, sanctuary from, from enemies or from uh, threats of one kind or another. And yet, uh, of course, when you are on a retreat, when you're in a solitary situation for perhaps days at a time, it could be an isolated retreat where you're not seeing anyone else at all, or it could be a retreat where you're, you're in communion with fellow retreatants where you have meals together uh, and uh, some opportunities to communicate. But in general, my experience in Buddhist retreats has been that the flavor is to provide you with the context in which you can be genuinely by yourself and have minimal contact with other human beings. Then, then what happens, uh, asking the uh -huh. $64,000 question, I'm dating myself, Sure. <laughs> what, what, what happens then when you, you do that? Well, I think the I've had I've done maybe four or five retreats ranging from one week to a month, and the initial I, 
in, in every one of them that I've been on, uh, the first two or three days, what happens is that there's a gradual calming down of the mind's activity. Uh, having a, doing a practice, a meditation practice, or a contemplative practice, perhaps in the, in the Christian meditative tradition, um, one has a focus for one's um, activity, and that is the focus is to rest your mind and begin to allow uh, un, um, uncontaminated space to uh, arise. So what happens, Lee, is there's a sense of, of beginning. Initially, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, nervousness. In my experience, I'll talk, that's all I can talk from, really. Um, this a sense of uh, slowing down. Um, but there's no routine to be involved in. There's a, a, a quality of uh, perhaps struggle initially, Reverend Udell. Struggle to the spirit. Struggle, a struggle to relax almost. <laughs> it's paradoxical, but when you don't have anything to do, quote unquote, um, in, in, in the Buddhist retreats it's suggested that you don't have uh, any distracting materials with you, maybe a couple of books uh, that pertain to your, to your practice, but no uh, radios and no cell phones and no uh, varieties of snacks and uh, other kinds of things that, that perhaps in the course of our regular lives we, we've gotten accustomed to having available to us to tide us over when we're, when we're agitated or nervous. So the whole point of it is to, to see if we can get to a place where we're actually just being content from moment to moment with our moment to moment experience without having to uh, seek any kind of entertainment, any kind of distraction. How was your retreat when you, was yours, I know you were recently on a, a retreat, Lee. Right. Would that describe your experience at all? Yeah. I think so, uh, and it was very interesting. What, uh, after I was back home, after the retreat was over, it was an eight-day silent retreat mm -hmm. where you don't talk mm -hmm. except to your spiritual director uh, by the Atlantic Ocean mm -hmm. uh, down in Massachusetts at Gloucester. And uh, I, for the first time when I was at home after the retreat was over, uh, I remembered exactly the the, uh, the the way the building looked and what the routine was, mm. and everything had an air of of uh, sanctity and uh, clarity and mm -hmm. meaning uh, mm. that I wasn't fully aware that I was moving in that direction when mm -hmm. I was actually there. Uh, it, it sort of caught me up, and uh, uh, when I got back home, I, I found myself still on retreat, you might say. Hmm. It was a, a unique circumstance for me. So the, the, uh, there was a heightened vividness in your perceptions. The clarity of the buildings and the, mm -hmm. the, the sanctity of the space. I, I think that is absolutely um, spot on, as they say, that it, when you are in a situation where you're um, dwelling mm -hmm. in the still point. Uh, when the you're still point of the turning world. Yeah, when you, when you really are uh, experiencing genuine stillness. Of mind and body, then you, your senses are uh, unfettered, as it were, and you're directly and clearly experiencing your environment, external and internal. And interestingly, in your case that you described recently, um, 
unfortunately, you, you weren't quite as aware of it until you were out of the retreat, right. and, and it actually came to your mind how how vividly you were perceiving things. And I, I think that's absolutely the the, the the elemental aspect of retreat is, is that it's an invitation to for us to return to our senses, you know, come to our senses in a way, you know, both in terms of the uh, the um, generic meaning of that, come come to your senses, kind of wake up to your basic clarity of, of, of awareness, and cut through the daily confusion of the uh, so-called rat race so that you can rest more comfortably and vividly in your everyday life. So the quality of the experience, of course, is a reflection of your state of mind. And uh, um, the most recent retreat that I went on, and I think you had me on this show to talk about it a few years ago, there was a, a sense of the first uh, week of it, I was extremely agitated. Reverend Udell, I was so agitated because uh, I had had a period of um, of real agitation in my life, uh, where I had lost my temper. Uh, in you? Relation. Yes, indeedy. I had lost my temper rather remarkably in a uh, situation with a, a house guest, you could say. Um, whom I, had, I felt that had overstayed his welcome, and uh, unfortunately, I did not uh, treat uh, that situation with with very much uh, peacefulness and calm abiding. Even though I'm a so-called practicing uh, Buddhist, practicing Buddhist, or Buddhist, um, so it. Uh, by our, our titles don't necessarily accurately reflect our realities. Uh, no, no. So uh, for none of us. So interestingly, in in the in the in the tradition of uh, Buddhist psychology, if you will, one of the um, tenets is that one act of aggression can reverberate for thousands of years. Wow. Wow. And um, it, it took me a full week to abate the amount of agitation and aggression that I had stirred up in myself as a result of that encounter with my unfortunate house guest. Uh, a full week of uh, literal uh, suffering on a, on a spit of uh, regret and uh, pain and um, in some ways being attacked by negative energies. And feeling, feeling, um, be besieged by by negative forces, which I had unleashed through my own uh, aggressive behavior. And if you think about the the world and mm. some of the dilemmas that are ongoing in the world, a lot of it has to do with aggressions that occurred years ago, hundreds of years ago, and some instances thousands of years ago where there are still uh, feuds and, and uh, vengeance motifs operative. So curbing aggression and, and, and cultivating patience and peacefulness is a big part of, of uh, meditation practice and uh, retreat practice mm -hmm. where we, it's, it is said that whatever we do comes back to um, remind us of, of our past actions, that, that there's a, there's a uh, resultant to every action that we engage in, and that ultimately we must l see the uh, impact of our actions. And I think that uh, coming to terms with life as we as we age and as our uh, clock has fewer ticks left on it, um, speaking for myself, there's a, a quality of wanting to, to resolve issues and to uh, establish um, clarity and peacefulness in, in, uh, in all activities. 
Is that true in the, the Christian uh, contemplative path I too? I think so. What are the goals of, of uh, a Christian retreat? The overall pattern? Well, to be more like Christ, I suppose, but uh, not to be the same as Christ. You, 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 you are your own personality, your own uniqueness. Mm -hmm. and I think it's fallacious to, uh, to think that we're supposed to be all little Jesuses walking around because uh, it's not possible and not desirable. In, uh, in the same way that a, a, a Buddhist, a Buddhist uh, isn't necessarily a, a, a perfect reflection of the Buddha. No the awakened one, nor would a Christian be expected to be a perfect reflection of the Christ, right. but one aspires towards that. Uh, living in the, in the joy and spirit and wholeness of, of, of the relationship with God, that would be the, the, the goal. Mm -hmm. So uh, paralleling that in the, the Buddhist meditation tradition, there is the the invitation to look unswervingly at whatever you're experiencing, to allow oneself to, to be genuinely present with whatever is happening in your experience. If it's painful or sad or frightening, the invitation uh, in the meditative tradition of the Buddha Dharma is to, to remain unswervingly present with what you're experiencing. And I think that's somewhat in contradiction to the general cultural expectation of where we want to get away from mm -hmm. unpleasantness and uh, change, make, make things be different. If, they, if we don't like how they are, we want to try to make them different. But in meditative practice, the idea is to be, to be vividly present with what you're experiencing and take it as a raw, direct experience, like a straight drink, so that you can be uh, privy to and actually uh, mindful of that which is occurring in your experience. You want to say a few words about the, the Buddhist uh, meditative practice of sitting on a cushion or in a many people, maybe 10, 12, 15, sitting on cushions in a, in a room <coughs> with no, no music, no lecture, no readings, just being still. Mm -hmm. what, what is the purpose of that and, and how do you uh, how do you keep from falling asleep? Tranquility, uh, abiding in tranquility in, in a sense of equilibrium, uh, equanimity, uh, allowing yourself, the idea of it is to allow yourself to settle, to settle, to settle, to settle, so that you're not struggling and grasping and chasing and, and uh, agitating. But in order to do that, you have to allow yourself to feel and notice your struggles and your graspings and your agitation. To notice it from the standpoint of being strongly present in your body and vividly aware of your breathing and also noticing that everything that you are experiencing is transient. It arises, manifests, and dissipates. So that you begin to realize that you don't have to be caught up quite so much in the um, struggle. You can actually relax into your basic nature, which is wholesome, open, intelligent. And doing that in a room full of other people, uh, you, it's amplified to a degree. You have a, a, a sense of fellow practitioners, mm -hmm. all of whom are on their own personal journey, all of whom have their own unique particular struggles and uh, desires, hopes, fears, etc. And there's a common uh, quality uh, of courageous pursuit of overcoming um, the tendency to be um, neurotically bound by one's storyline, uh, by one's um, conditioning history, and to begin to flourish as free people, free from uh, the burden of unnecessary suffering. So doing it in a group, I've often been told by people, uh, provides encouragement. Mm -hmm. it, it amplifies the quality of spaciousness. And it also invites um, a sense of community. 
So sitting for hours in a room with a dozen other people and not, not anything being said uh, creates a context that we don't often experience in life. Yeah, that's true. Because so we're usually trying to fill space through teaching, training, learning, uh, commenting, entertaining, etc. And I find that oftentimes people tell me they're not very comfortable with silence. Who would say you're supposed to be? Who would say? Yeah, I mean, who, who says you're supposed to be comfortable with silence? Um, I don't know that anyone says you're supposed to be comfortable with silence. But <laughs> it's my experience that, for example, if you're in an elevator with a bunch of strangers, um, it's usually a fairly uncomfortable few moments until uh, you get to your next spot because nobody knows each other, nobody knows what to say. Oh, that's not universally the case. But silence is golden. You remember that? Yep. Aphorism from I forget what it's quoted childhood. From. I think it was used by parents to try to get their kids to be quiet. Silence is golden. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Yeah. All things come to she who waits. If you wait long enough in one place, the whole world will pass before you. These kind of um, uh, what do you call them? Riddles or uh, invitations to directly experience without having to interject commentary allows for a connection with oneself which may be quite peaceful. It may actually allow us to truly relax. As a matter of fact, I've often heard it said from meditation teachers that the key element in developing a peaceful mind is relaxation. Mm -hmm. And a peaceful body, for that matter, is relaxation. And that, I think, is the key goal of meditation practice, is to, whether you're doing it in a group or whether you're doing it on retreat, uh, whether you're doing it in your, your spare moments at home, is to be genuinely present in your body and at the same time be relaxed and, and alert without a, without a particular agenda. It's hard to do. Why is it hard, do you think, Reverend Udell? Our mind is always flirting, flitting around. That's the nature of the mind, is to be active, to be curious. But I don't know if it's to be flitting. But we feel that it's flitting. And we feel that it's fleeting. The time is fleeting. And I think that, that rouses fear. That we can't really control events. We can't control our lives, our lifespan. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when we're going to lose our faculties. We don't know when we're going to lose our connections, our jobs, our, our loved ones, our health, etc. There's a constant quality of uh, what the Buddha referred to as the one of the main characteristics of uh, the world of struggle, and that is impermanence, that everything is impermanent. That no matter what we have, we're not going to be able to keep it. And we're continuously losing uh, access to mm -hmm. each moment. And yet, uh, that quality of impermanence is 
is what, um, what actually allows us to have a life at all. Because if it weren't impermanent, then there'd just be one big solid chunk of unchanging uh, inertness. So it's both a, uh, a challenge and also a uh, freeing element. Let me tell you a little bit about my retreat, the, the bones of it. And I like your comments about it, about what, what it provides and what it appears not to provide. Uh, it was at a very uh, fancy estate that the Jesuits uh, uh, bought up years ago from a wealthy family on, right on the Atlantic uh, coast. It's a mansion, a big mansion with an extensive uh, uh, area for, for more people than originally w w was needed in, in, in this mansion. I mean, the stones are you know, huge, and, and there are some archways with, where the, they're over your head, and they're just in place, and you hope they're not going to mm. fall down on you. Mm. Uh, and they have uh, room for about 60 people, mm -hmm. both sexes at the same time. Mm. You have your own private room uh, in, the, in this area. Uh, they have what's uh, an area that's sort of uh, they look like a, like a college dorm a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not the, where I I'm at. I'm at the the mansion, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I I need because the bathrooms are all very nearby. Right. And at my age, I need the bathroom close, whereas the, the college uh, arrangement, the, the bathrooms are, are more distant from the rooms. Mm -hmm. You have to know where you're going, otherwise you'll get lost. Um, they're marked, but still, it's confusing. <coughs> All of the rooms have a pretty nice little view of the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's your room for the, there's no, there's no dorm area. You have your own private room. Mm -hmm. No one has a lock on their door. Right. And uh, there's a lot of wind sometimes. And what you do is they have good sized rocks that they have on the floor. Keep the door from blowing open. You got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really needed. <laughs> mm. It's really needed. Uh, they have a very f open, easy kind of uh, way f for, the, for, for feeding you. Uh, you can go down to where the food is anytime, really. At uh, five in the morning, they have a coffee pot on, uh, or, or a little bit later at six o'clock, uh, and they'll have dry cereal, and they have fruit and milk, and, and uh, and then a little bit later, maybe around seven to nine, they'll have fresh eggs and, mm. and other kinds of, uh, of items. Uh, but there's no sitting down with everybody else. No one says grace. Mm -hmm. you, you just come uh -huh. on your own uh -huh. and you serve yourself. Now, because I'm so blind, literally, uh, I, I can't see what's on, on the steam table. Mm. So I, I, I ask, speaking boldly, but quietly, I, uh, I, I ask people, uh, what, what do we have to eat here this morning? <laughs> and so they t tell me, and they usually say, do you want some help? And I always say, yes, I, I need some help. And so then they, they'll go and do it for me, put it on a tray, and then I'll take the tray, and, or, or they'll put, take the tray, and mm -hmm. they're big tables uh, around that hold maybe uh, eight or ten uh, at, at a table, and uh, we're all individual chairs, and, uh, and the ocean is behind us with these big windows, so you're looking out on the ocean, and mm -hmm. then there are some comfortable chairs, so you can sit down in a comfortable chair later w with a lot of upholstery, and they even have uh, uh, binoculars there that, that for you to borrow and just hold up and look at the ocean. That's part of the context of your retreat. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And they even have ship to shore radio. Mm -hmm. I've never gotten into that. Uh, <clears throat> and then you get up and leave uh, from your breakfast whenever you, you want. Mm -hmm. But usually everyone's finished by around 9 o'clock. But they try to have no pressure on you. There's no rising bell. There's no, uh -huh. there's no uh, like some monasteries, they'll say, let us bless the Lord. And then, oh, uh, uh, time to get up, I guess. Mm. But they don't do that. It's no... Uh, Follow your own pace. Yeah, your own pace. And uh, uh, then you have the morning free. Uh, I, I had uh, my spiritual director, I, I saw, uh, he was, I chose him as I knew him mm. and asked if I could see him for the duration of the eight-day uh, retreat, and the answer was yes. He'd be happy to accept you? Yep. I don't know if any time he ever would say no, but mm -hmm. uh, he had his own uh, room and quarters in another part of the building, mm -hmm. up a rickety winding wooden staircase, <laughs> which uh, uh, they were worried that I would fall down and break my neck, but I reassured them I, I'm a former mountain climber, mm. and uh, as long as there's a, a, a railing there, I, I'm all right. Mm -hmm. If there's no railing to hold on to, then I'm in trouble, but uh, with a, I was okay. But I, I liked the charm of that. So I saw him at 9.45 uh, every day. Mm -hmm. And then I would sit there in, in privacy with, with him, and I would bring up whatever I wanted to talk about, asking him for his, his wisdom, his mm -hmm. ideas, his mm -hmm. prayers, his thoughts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I did that every day when I was there. Uh -huh. And then, and I also asked him, could I keep up my relationship with him in, in Boston? The, the Jesuits have, a, have a, uh, a, uh, a headquarters there with rooms to stay overnight if you want, and, and meeting rooms. Uh, could I see him there and make an appointment? And he said, sure. So it's an open-ended relationship. Uh, but. For the eight-day retreat, it was limited just to those eight, eight days. And you don't talk except uh, with your retreat director. Uh, and uh, that's it. You don't say, pass the salt, please. Or, mm -hmm. or, boy, the weather looks kind of mean. The wind is picking up. You don't say anything like that. Mm -hmm. Or what do you do with your quiet time here? Uh, it's you're stuck with it, you know. <laughs> stuck with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You you, uh, you have to stick with it. Yeah. You know you you do. And I like it. I, the first time I went was back in eight, uh, eighty five, and I thought I'd go crazy about the third day of not speaking. Uh, but now I I, I love it. Mm. I, I I I just enjoy it. Uh, and then you, you, when you finish with your seeing your director, then you get up and, and you go out for a walk or up to your room or get a nap or the, all of the required things you have to do, like uh, uh, clean up the kitchen or feed the dog or, or go grocery shopping or, or, or rearrange the basement. All of those things are gone from you. You don't have to do any of that. It's, you have no, no responsibility for the house. They, they do invite you, if you want to help, to uh, clean the tablecloth uh, in, in each table uh, where we eat. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's purely up to you. Right. Uh, there's no, no required task. Uh, then you have lunch. Uh, then they play on a very nice audio uh, uh, radio uh, phonograph or disc player uh, cl classical music uh, mm. as long as you want to be there for maybe an hour and, uh, and then when that's over uh, you're, you get up but no, nobody uh, 
uses the music as a signal to, to leave. Uh, it's just there. And then uh, you have the afternoon free, and some people go out for long walks along the, the ocean. Others nap, uh, others read books, others pray. Mm. Uh, but you're not supposed to go off and uh, find a nice beach uh, and go swimming. <laughs> That's not part of the retreat. Uh -huh. uh, and then in the evening you have supper at 6 o'clock. And uh, uh, again, I would ask somebody, what's, what's on the steam table here? What, what are we eating today? And they, would, they always uh, offered me help. Right. Even before I ask, what 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 is the food? Sure, and that's just other guests. It wasn't staff. It wasn't my director. And I appreciate it very much, because with my poor vision, I I really can't see. And uh, and then you're free uh, when supper is over. Usually around quarter to seven. Uh, to do whatever you want again for the rest of the of the evening. Mm -hmm. One of the things I like to do was to uh, go and, oh, they, I forgot mass. They have mass every day at 5 o'clock, mm -hmm. uh, and everyone participates. And uh, uh, even people like me who are, are not Roman Catholic, uh, they have been invited me in past years to, uh, to uh, communicate people with a chalice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I consider that a real privilege and an mm -hmm. honor to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, they have women who, 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 who preach as well as, uh, as men as, who, who preach. Uh, there was a time when the cardinal in Boston heard that we were letting women preach, and he said, no, you can't do that. And so the Jesuits, this is a Jesuit house, they are a very free-thinking bunch. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay. Uh, so at, during the Mass, instead of having the usual uh, uh, sermon, we'll not have a sermon at all. And we'll just, because you're not allowing women to preach, so no one will preach. Then when the service was over, then we had a woman preach. Uh -huh. So the, the, the cardinal was obeyed, you might say, right. but we did what we wanted to do. <laughs> Very clever. Now we have a different cardinal, and uh, so... Uh, He's more was, open. Yeah, I think it was Cardinal Law before. Mm. Are the guests all uh, clerics or are there no, lay people? Mostly well? lay people. Mostly lay. Mm -hmm. Some, some uh, monks and, and sisters, and uh, and some like me who are not Roman Catholic at all. Yeah. There's no. Uh, you're, you're not shunned or put in a in a uh, negative position. Mm. If, you, if you're not Roman Catholic, sure. uh, it's particularly free and open. And what, uh, what kind of folk are there from all walks of life? Or you don't know because you didn't talk to them, You right? don't talk to them. They're the just o fellow beings, right? Yeah, the only time you can talk is at the, f the first night there when we have supper together or the, when we have uh, lunch uh, after the last mass on the day we're leaving. So there's not much time to talk, mm. but uh, uh, they're mostly lay people. Yeah, in, in the sense that I think both of our traditions uh, abide. It's, it's a bit of a privilege, I think, to be able to go on a retreat. It implies you have the time, right. the resources, and uh, the strength and energy to do it and that uh, someone has gone to a great degree of effort to create the circumstances to provide Definitely. for this. And, um, yeah, and they have a whole staff to right. support you, you might right. say. A, a good kitchen crew right. who cook and do all of that, you know, dishwashing. We don't do any of that. Yeah. So it's a luxury. It's a kind of, um, in the the Maslowian hierarchy of, of uh, actualization, it's one of the higher um, levels of actualization of experience. You, you've gotten your basic needs taken care of across the board, and you're in, in a position to be able to have a transcendent or uh, 
a peak, I guess he called it, Maslow, the psychologist from the 50s and 60s, Abraham Maslow yeah. talked about actualization, self-actualization, hierarchies, and the, uh, the ultimate peak experience was when you have, you have all of your basic needs met, and then you're in a position to kind of go into the, the realms of, of uh, self-realization, transcendence, and affiliate connection with the spirit. Thank you Christ. for saying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Uh, same thing for a, a Buddhist uh, retreat? Uh, yes, there's, there, you, there's, a, there's a setting in which you come to. In, in a place that I have done my retreats is at, in Barnett, Vermont, yep. at a center called uh, Karma Choling, sometimes called the Tail of the Tiger. Uh, and there are uh, 15 or so uh, retreat cabins on a 600-acre property. The cabins are set up with uh, wood stoves, kerosene lanterns, necessary implementation, food uh, utensils, and sleeping quarters uh, for one. There are single, uh, single, single person cabins. They're solitary, designed for solitary retreats. And your food, you, you bring your food in from uh, the central stores in the main building. Um, you have to cook? Yeah, you, if you want to boil an egg, you, know, you have a little kerosene stove or a propane stove, but you can make beans and rice, boil an egg, uh, grill a burger. But you don't have any refrigeration so you have to have uh, foods that are not going to go bad on you. Uh, they might have a few ice packs in a cooler that will keep perishables um, free from decay for a few days. But there's no cooking staff. No, it's, when you're on retreat, it's, it's totally your solitary retreat. It's totally self-contained. You have to do all of the work yourself as a privy an outdoor uh, a toilet. Outdoor? And, yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of basic um, survival situation. It's not... Like a New England uh, outhouse. Yeah, you have an outhouse and a, a, a little cabin with... Uh, showers? Uh, no, no showers. You have to do rinsing, you know, have to rinse yourself. And, Cat washing. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's bare bones. But it's, it, it's excellent. It's very well comported. The, the cabins are comfortable. And Beds are all right? They're simple, spare, um, basic essentials. No yeah. frills. Now, do you see a spiritual director? You have a uh, meeting with a meditation instructor um, in the middle of your retreat. One visit. One visit? One visit. Wow. Where the meditation instructor, uh, unless you're doing a total solo retreat, in, in, in that case you won't, meet, you won't see anybody for the duration of your retreat. But uh, if, you're, if it's not a total solo retreat, then you have one visit with a meditation instructor in the very middle of it. And that person will come up to your cabin at a designated time and you'll prepare tea for that person and you'll have a chance to discuss how your meditation practice is going. And then he or she uh, disappears, and you don't see anybody again till the end of your retreat. <laughs> wow! Although you will see animals, I mean, you see deer, oh. and smaller animals uh, during the course of your retreat, and you'll hear the birds singing. Of course, you'll see birds, and you'll experience the weather, the changes in the weather, and you primarily what you experience is your own inner commentary on what is going on here, how the very aspects of your life that maybe play uh, just beneath the surface of your regular life, your, your minor irritations and agitations and hopes and fears, is those, there those will come more into play. Is there heat in the building? Yeah, your, there's wood stoves. Your, your cabin, you have to feed it though. You have to feed it, you have to build the fire and maintain the fire. And there is a supply of wood that's typically left in a sheltered spot beside the cabin so that you don't have to go out and cut your wood or <laughs> drag it in from the 
deadfall from the bush. So it's, you, you have to uh, take responsibility. A lot, of, a lot of, I think, the Buddhist view is, that, is to become responsible for your body, speech, and mind. You're fully responsible for accessing your own resources as it were. The life situation was quite luxurious then. Apparently you had some pretty good perks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been on, on uh, group retreats where there's, I think yours was a group retreat. But Typically the, if you're on a group there's retreat, no lectures or anything. a Buddhist group retreat, you'll have food, food provided for you. But solitary retreats imply solitary situation here on your own. So a lot of it has to, the solitary retreat focus is to, I think, give you the opportunity to become uh, familiar with yourself. That's one of the definitions of meditation, becoming familiar, familiarizing, becoming mm. familiar with your mind. Let me ask you, there's a practice that I've, I've, I've uh, heard the Dalai Lama does, that when, he's, when he sits down to meditate, his, his eye, eyes focus up in, in, in his eye sockets, and he just have the whites of his eyes, that's all you see. And a friend of mine who's a Buddhist says that uh, when you do that, you can meditate more efficiently. Do you know anything about that? I am not familiar with that um, Dalai Lama practice, but I, I, uh, I've had some acquaintance with an American meditation practice called Silva Mind Control. Oh yes, yeah, I remember that. And my recollection from that, Silva, S-I-L-V-A, Jose Silva, the founder of Silva Mind Control, is that when you raise your eyes 45 degrees or higher from horizontal plane, that that activity, that action, results in the generation of alpha brainwave activity, which is a slower, it's also associated with dreaming and sleep, it's a slower brainwave activity, and that state of mind is conducive to transcendent states or states of, of deeper inner relaxation. So that's my association to that, Lee. Okay, that's helpful. I've also heard this Jose Silva was a very uh, devout Roman Catholic. Really? Silva was? Silva was and probably still is. And he, um, I heard a, a, a talk that, that he gave once where he suggested that the biblical injunction to raise up your eyes unto the hills from whence cometh come your, your help, help is actually a hidden guide to achieving alpha states of mind. Wow. Interesting. And if you do, if you if you if the audience is interested in trying it, if you if you roll your eyes back up towards the eye sockets and keeping your head in a stationary plane, it generates a feeling of relaxation. And it, it also is a precursor to sleeping. Because when we fall asleep, our eyes tend to roll upwards. Really? And also when we die, our eyes roll upwards. Hmm. It's kind of releasing this, ourselves to the spirit. Intriguing. It conceivably is a, a built-in biological mechanism. <coughs> but when you're really content and relaxed, uh, you, your vigilance threshold drops. And you're not as oriented to survival activity as you are when you're very deeply relaxed. Accordingly, you then can uh, connect with states of peaceful mind and um, mm. bliss, if you will. Bliss states. States of bliss. Yeah, oh, that's special. Fearless presence. Mm. I guess a lot of our lives are, fent are spent warding off uh, potential threats, 
uh, making sure that we are, are able to survive and, and manage against all the challenges of life. And it's fairly rare when, when at least in my day-to-day -day experience, when we can fully and completely relax. We're approaching the end of the hour, I guess. Five minutes. Lee, and... Um, we just started. It seemed, the time seemed to be quite uh, evanescent today. Quite, must be some. Uh, must have been a flow going on. Well, so I, in summation, I, I would say Buddhist meditation and retreat and Christian are somewhat similar. There are significant differences, but they're... Yes, all roads lead to Rome. There's a saying in Buddhism that all, all dharmas or all, all truths agree at some point, that mm -hmm. all versions of reality have to be in agreement at some point or else there'd just be a Tower of Babel. <laughs> it's true. Reality is reality. A rose by any other name remains a rose, they say. Now, why, why we only have uh, four minutes left? <coughs> what, but this is a different subject, but very briefly, why do Buddhists say that they don't believe in God? What do they mean by that? Uh, that, that they, don't, they do believe in a higher power, in, in a, if you want to use that word or term. Well, but but the Buddha discovered that it was possible to achieve states of union or um, fearless presence without positing the existence of somebody who is going to take care of you or save you or condemn you. So they don't deny the existence of God, but they suggest that it's possible to achieve um, peacefulness and a, a sense of complete realization of your capabilities, intelligence, worth, wisdom, without referencing a creator or an external helper entity. And I think it's posited on the discovery that uh, the, the contention that the mind actually is the ultimate accommodation of ultimate reality, that the mind contains everything. So it would contain God as well. It's just that there isn't any sense of separation. There's no um, subject or object dichotomy in Buddhism, ultimately. That there's just presence, awareness, openness, clarity and accommodation. I, th I think a Christian would say that too, in the deepest sense. And another aspect of it is, is that there, the notion that there is no beginning and there is no end. Things just are. Somebody didn't start at all by shaking a, Shazam. Yeah, a stick and saying, now there will be the world. Things just are. If you can relax with that idea, uh, I, I found it to be rather compelling just to not be so worried about a beginning and an end, but rather there's just this wonderful world that we're in and it's always been there, always will be. We've been talking with Dr. Richard Doz, a clinical psychologist and Buddhist uh, practitioner. We've been talking about uh, retreats from the Buddhist point of view and from the Christian point of view. So thank you for watching and, and uh, following us with your own spirit and uh, we missed your f not phoning in but I hope you had a good time we did indeed we did <laughs> amen thank you Richard a pleasure sir